Good morning, everyone. Hope you all have had a fruitful three days. We're in our third day. So thank you so much for being on this stage with me and our amazing speakers who are coming up. Um, I'm Laura Evans, as you heard, uh, and I'm president and CEO of Laura Evans Media. And we are so honored to be a media partner with uh, Concordia throughout this summit. Um, and I am pleased to be your official host. As in that role, I will be introducing topics, conducting polling, and then offering some perspective on the polling that we will see here on the screens. We will have meaningful, insightful discussions today on on topics ranging from how to address healthcare priorities to gender inclusion to food insecurity and so much more. We encourage everyone to stay for the discussions. Please make your way out to the public spaces during breaks so that you can network and really talk about and get dig into these uh, topics that we'll be hearing today. Share your perspectives um, with the other summit attendees. Before we begin, just making sure for those of you who haven't been with us the past couple of days that you have your, uh, your Wi-Fi. It is um, easy to access. It's the, ne the network is Concordia. Password is Concordia23. It's also on the back of your badge in case you forget. Um, we will be doing the polling, as I mentioned, and we'll have two to three polls after each block of programming and right before we go to break. So let's just give you an example of what this is going to look like. If you want to take part, you go to pigeonhole.at and uh, the password is Concordia23. It's all caps so that you can participate right on your smartphone or your, on your tablet. Um, your polling answers will be anonymous, so you don't need to worry about that. And then um, whenever a question is asked, you'll see it on the screen here. So it's, the poll is active. You can respond to the prompt. Um, and as long as it stays active on your phone, you can continue to enter your, um, your answers in real time. And we will see in real time how these come up. So let's just give you a test uh, to how this will work. So these are the questions here. Which iconic New York City landmark best represents your personality? Is it the Statue of Liberty symbolizing freedom and independence? Are you Times Square? Are you always in the spotlight and full of energy? Are you Central Park? That is nature lover and tranquility seeker or Coney Island? fun-loving and adventurous. So you can see how these play out and, um, and how these will work uh, as we go forward today. We'll have two to three polling questions, like I said, before each break. So I will start with our first panel, introducing our first panel. And um, this is about uh, addressing healthcare priorities to LMICs, low and middle income countries with universal health coverage. This one is sponsored by Merck. We're addressing healthcare priorities in those LMICs. And um, this will be a very interesting discussion. We will welcome to the stage now, Carmen Villar, Merck's VP of Social Business Innovation and the esteemed panel. Well, thank you, and thanks to Concordia. Thank you all for being here bright and early on the third day of this great event. I'm here with uh, Dr. Tom Frieden, who is the president of Resolve to Save Lives. Did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Um, and Katie Dane, who is the CEO of the NCD Alliance. And so we're gonna be talking about NCDs today. Um, for those of you who may not know, non-communicable diseases are those chronic conditions that we think about in terms of cancer, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, and they cause 41 million preventable deaths per year. They often get less attention than some of the infectious diseases that we talk about. But of all the NCDs, cardiovascular disease is the leading killer responsible for over a third of all global deaths. And so if you didn't know that, you might be surprised. But if you did know that, what I'd like to know from our experts here today is as the leading cause of death worldwide, why do you think cardiovascular disease has, hasn't yet benefited from the kind of attention and resource mobilization as some of the other diseases we hear about? So Tom, why don't you go first? I think the fundamental reason is that there's a misconception that we can't do anything about it, that it's inevitable. And so that misconception comes from three different drivers. The first is it's largely invisible. It's invisible because it's so common. We all know people who have heart attacks and strokes and we just think it's a normal part of life. That ties into the second thing that we think it's inevitable. Uh, really you know, gonna happen, everyone's gonna die from something so it has to happen. And third, really ageist assumption is it's only old people as if 
old people we don't care about. What that misses fundamentally is that we can stop cardiovascular disease. Most of the heart attacks and strokes in the world are preventable with easily reachable technologies that we have today. And in fact, um, about a third of all of the deaths are among young people. Mm -hmm. uh, it's almost half in low and middle income countries, younger age population. And also, it's crucial to know that if you have healthy heart health throughout life, you're more likely to have a vibrant, full lifespan, less risk of dementia, re less risk of uh, in, a, in any form of disability. So I think the, the fundamental issue is this misconception that we can't do anything about it. And the good news is we can. Just yesterday, for the first time ever, the World Health Organization released a uh, report on hypertension globally, showing that this single leading preventable cause of death can be dramatically controlled. And if we do that, it will prevent 76 million deaths, 120 million strokes, and 80 million heart attacks over the next 25 years. Amazing. Congratulations to you and WHO for putting that report. I know you guys supported that effort quite a bit. Katie? Thanks. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start actually by congratulating Concordia for stopping their relationship with the tobacco industry. You know, we know that tobacco industry's products kill 8 million people every single year. Um, they have absolutely no role in public health and sustainable development and events like this. So I think it's absolutely, you know, really good news that Concordia has removed Philip Morris International from sponsorship and from, from the lineup, essentially. Mm -hmm. Getting to the question, um, I mean, I, I agree with what Tom has, has said already. I think as well, there have been misconceptions about the fact that NCDs are not a development issue, that they're actually just impacting upon high income countries. And obviously, we know this is completely the reverse. Mm -hmm. It's actually low and middle income countries that are being, being hit the hardest. And people within those countries are, are dealing with NCDs at a much younger age. It's the breadwinners of families who are dealing with these conditions. So I think that's beginning to change. I think the other aspect has been that NCDs were previously seen essentially as a huge cost. Um, that governments didn't really understand the return on investment in terms of actually, you know, tackling early diagnosis of hypertension, of diabetes, um, of the population-wide prevention policies that we can put in place. And actually, for every dollar that a government spends on NCDs, they get a return on investment of $7. Mm. So this is all changing. This has changed hugely over the last decade. You know, NCDs were forgotten within the Millennium Development Goals in 2015, included in the Sustainable Development Era, um, and overall, I think there's obviously a lot more action and attention on these issues today. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the SDGs, and, and we're here. We know the second half of the week is really focused at the UN high-level meeting on universal health coverage. So maybe you could talk a little bit about what that means in, in this fight um, to prevent cardiovascular disease and, and where we fit in. You kind of started to go there a little bit at the end of, of your previous answer. Sure. So, you know, universal health coverage is obviously all about, you know, everybody everywhere receiving access to essential services they need when they need it without risk of financial hardship. Right. And for most countries around the world, low middle income countries, particularly the main challenges are essentially the NCD burden. You know, so many people um, in, in terms of access to essential medicines, technologies, diagnostic equipment, it remains completely out of reach for most people largely due to you know, availability of essential meds and techs, that the shelves are empty, um, they're not reaching the patients, that there's huge markups in the supply chain and actually getting to the people. Um, but also in terms of out-of-pocket expenditure, you know, we know that for every, um, uh, uh, every visit to a health facility, a person living with an NCD will be paying double what a person living with an infectious disease will be paying. So it's really landing on the shoulders of people living with NCDs in terms of the cost, mm -hmm. rather than governments including it in things like national health insurance schemes. So in terms of making universal health coverage really work for NCDs, what we need to see is a complete reorientation of the health system, right? Most health systems in low middle income countries are still really oriented towards acute care needs to shift to much more of a chronic care model, which prioritizes early detection, uh, health promotion and, and, and prevention, um, as well as obviously kind of a chronic care model, because people living with diabetes, uh, cancer, are living with these conditions for a very long period of time, sometimes the most of their life. 
Um, the other thing that we need to see is a focus on primary care, because yes. primary care is where the rubber hits the road. You know, these are the opportunities where we can be meeting people in communities, to be raising awareness of the different risk factors, to be really maximizing that opportunity of when someone does come into a health center, that we're really trying to treat them as a whole. We're not kind of, you know, segmenting people in terms of, okay, you've got HIV AIDS, I'm gonna treat you for HIV. Why not integrate hypertension? Why not integrate integrate diabetes? And we're beginning to see this change in many countries. Okay, that's really helpful. It's interesting because you said primary health care and you said chronic conditions. And it seems to me those words are very similar. If you're going for a primary health care and you have a chronic condition, it seems that it would be addressed at, at that point. So what's the disconnect there, do you think? I think the disconnect has been, um, it goes back to the first question you asked, which is why NCDs have been neglected. It's about financing. Mm. You know, our global financing um, system for health has always been this very vertical siloed approach. Yeah. You know, obviously huge investments, quite rightly, in huge health issues over the years, HIV AIDS, women and children's health, much more recently COVID and pandemic preparedness. Um, but NCDs haven't received that level of funding. You know, less than 1% of official development assistance for health goes to NCDs. Mm. That's peanuts compared to the impact that it's having on developing countries. So unless we're actually seeing an increase in resources for NCDs, and what the NCD Alliance has been calling for is integrated financing, because as I said, makes no sense to be saving someone from AIDS for them only to die from cancer, cardiovascular disease later in life. So having a much more integrated approach to our financing um, approach for health. Yeah. Just to add to that, sure. it's it's in part good news, because if you look at HIV, tuberculosis, malaria, mm -hmm. there's been global investment, and with that, substantial global progress. In fact, the World Bank and World Health Organization earlier this week released the annual report on the status of universal health coverage, which shows the bad news is basically it's stalled mm -hmm. since 2015. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the overall trends, very substantial progress in the areas where there's investment. Yeah. And primary health care remains the most important and most neglected part of health care systems in many countries, including the United States. Yes. And, and that really is a political decision. So let's pull that thread a little bit more, Tom. When, when you and I worked together, you used to say that one of the cheapest public health interventions was around policy and changing policy. So what is your what are your thoughts on how we can really impact policy at government levels, at local levels, with civil society, to really change the narrative and make progr more progress towards NCD prevention? Policy change is the royal road to progress. It's how you can get fast progress for everyone. It's how you can increase equity. It's how you can make a level playing field for businesses. But policy change, as, as Katie and her alliance well know, requires a huge effort. It requires political leadership. It requires advocacy from civil society, from patients, families, and affected communities. And it requires rigorous monitoring of where we are to keep everyone on track and accountable. Thank you. Thank you for that. I think that's a key point that we don't always discuss uh, in the public health world or the global health world. So thanks so much. And I'll go back to you, Katie, for a second now. The name Alliance is in your name. So talk a little bit about the partnerships that you cultivate and why that's important in this fight. Sure. I mean, in, in NCDs, we know that it's everybody's business, right? No one sector can solve the issue alone, both in terms of the fact that NCDs wind up in the health system, but they're actually driven by sectors well beyond. So we need sectors well beyond the health system and the health sector. And I think in many countries, actually, you know, when you're talking about a whole of government response to NCDs, which is what we want to see, we want to see the Ministry of Health working together with the Ministry of Agriculture, Trade, Finance, Education, to be really mobilizing all of the expertise and resources to both prevent NCDs and better treat and manage them. I think the challenge we have there is that actually many ministries of health in low middle income countries within their governments are sometimes fairly weak uh, and they are very much focused, focused on the curative side mm. rather than perhaps the more preventative side. Mm. So that's one of the challenges. So we need kind of a beyond health response to NCDs, but we also need all different stakeholders to work together, right? The NCD Alliance has always very much pushed and pioneered kind of a multi-sectoral approach that we need governments, we need the relevant private sector, not unhealthy commodity industries, but the relevant private sectors. Uh, we need foundations, we need civil society. And what we do at the NCD Alliance particularly 
is we bring together this very broad family of civil society organizations across diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease, mental health, tobacco control, you name it. We all come together. Why do we come together at the global and national level? Because we have a clear common agenda. We've got a clear common agenda around the common risk factors, clear common agenda around the determinants that are driving so much of the inequities in NCDs and health overall and absolutely a common agenda around health systems that we've already talked about. So it's absolutely taking, um, takes a village to respond to NCDs, whether you're talking community or global level. Mm -hmm. And Tom, what would you say about partnerships and how you work at Resolve? It's absolutely essential. We, we uh, work with governments to strengthen the public sector because you're never going to get societal change without public policy and programs. Mm -hmm. And we work with civil society to support and also hold um, some accountability of the, the public sector. And that kind of partnership, which can include uh, civil society organizations, patient groups, um, healthcare worker associations, uh, companies, this can make a huge difference in advancing progress. Advocates and advocacy organizations uh, can often be the driving force. If you look at one real global success story, trans fat. Mm. Right? right here in New York City, we eliminated trans fat many years ago. Ultimately, the U.S. did. And now the World Health Organization, with, with our support, uh, called for the global elimination of artificial trans fat. It's a toxic chemical added to your food without your knowledge or consent that increases the risk of a heart attack and early death. Mm. There are today 3.7 billion people living in countries that are taking action to eliminate trans fat. And with the assistance of uh, Katie's group and others, more and more countries are taking action, Mexico and Pakistan recently. And um, we're seeing just huge progress. When the world eliminates trans fat, no one will know the difference. 17 million fewer people will die from heart attacks over the following 25 years, and only your heart will know the difference. The food will still taste great. All right, all right, good. You both talked about civil society and government. I think you threw in the private word there. So I, I would be remiss as coming from MSD if I didn't ask about private sector's role and how we could be a good partner to both of you. Well, I, I have one idea just to throw out there. Um, hypertension kills more people than anything else in the world. Diabetes is undertreated. High cholesterol also undertreated. The three first line medications for those three conditions are um, uh, metformin mm -hmm. for diabetes, yeah. Right? atorvastatin for high cholesterol, and amlodipine for hypertension. Yeah. They can all be made for about a penny a piece, sometimes less, maybe a little more. All over Africa, we partner with countries that cannot afford that because it's a penny a day, but it's for millions of patients for the whole year. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see the empty medicine shelves all over the world. So could there be a compact with industry and civil society to say to a country, if you establish systems that ensure that these medicines are used well, imported you know, in, a, in an easy way, uh, can we make these available free of cost to you as long as you make them available free of cost to the patients? Yeah. That's a real challenge. We do it in HIV, in TB, in malaria. We're not doing it for what's killing the most people. And if you look at prioritization, I, I have a very simplistic approach. What has the biggest health burden? What can we make the most difference in? You make the product of those two things and you have programs that can save literally tens of millions of lives. Biggest impact. I would say two things. I would say number one, it's about making sure that the private sector, pharmaceutical industry is thinking of their role be across the whole health ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, access to essential meds needs to be looked at across the whole, right? You need to have a strong health workforce. You need strong health financing. You need effective supply chains. You need really importantly empowered and educated patients. And you know, the pharmaceutical industry can play a role across all of that. It's not just about supplying and manufacturing essential medicines and products. It's about how that, that product actually gets to the people that we need. And the industry plays an important role. I'd say the second one is that you know, within the NCD Alliance, one of our priorities is to make sure that when we're talking about public-private partnerships, that people are not forgotten. And that, so in terms of access programs and access strategies, that we're actually ensuring that people living with NCDs are included and engaged and consulted from the very beginning. That we're actually thinking about what are the real challenges that people living with NCDs in Kenya, in Ghana, wherever it might be, are facing. And that we're actually structuring and orienting our programs and strategies around that. 
I think in, in when you compare the NCD space to the HIV AIDS response, for mm -hmm. example, it was always a no brainer that you had people living with affected leading the response and involved at every step of the way. In NCDs, it's taken a little while for us to get there, but you know, I think there's more and more recognition of the need for being people centered essentially. Okay. Good, we're getting close to, to wrapping up here. I guess if there were, I'm gonna ask two, you to make two points. One is on Thursday for the high level meeting on universal health coverage, what do you hope will come out of that discussion? And the second is what action can everybody here that's listening or listening to you on the live stream take to personally help towards this fight of ending NCDs? So. Well, I'll start with the bottom line. The Sustainable Development Goal calls for a one-third reduction in the risk of death among from the leading NCDs. Mm -hmm. And if you ask the simple question, it's great to have goals, but what's the plan? There are six things that the world can do that would lead to that progress. The first is tobacco control, and that's why Philip Morris has no place at a health-related event. They could end the tobacco epidemic if they wanted to, if they stopped opposing tobacco control legislation, if they stopped making their products more addictive intentionally, if they stopped addicting children just to start. Mm -hmm. Tobacco control, control and prevention of high blood pressure, control of air pollution, PM 2.5, mm -hmm. treatment and prevention of cancer with vaccines like the HPV vaccine, mm -hmm. Reduction of harmful alcohol use and elimination of trans fat. Those seven, six things, seven if you count <laughs> hypertension as two with prevention and treatment, would allow us to reduce deaths by one third by 2030. And that's what we have to focus on. Focused, specific action. And that's going to require better public policy and better primary health care in every country. Great. Thank you. Katie? I would say that you know that this week at the UN General Assembly, we've obviously got an unprecedented three high-level meetings happening, right? Pandemics, UHC, TB. Um, NCDs are intricately connected to all three of them. You know, at COVID-19, we saw that you know people living with NCDs were on the front line. They were the ones that were ending up in hospitals, um, complications, early death um, from you know the fact that they basically were living with hypertension or diabetes. So. You know, we need to make sure that NCDs are reflected well in all three of the high level meeting documents. And with UHC particularly, I think, I think we're seeing that. You know, I was lucky enough to be at the high level meeting on UHC in 2019, just four years ago, and it felt like a very different time. We were still kind of getting recognition for NCDs and now it feels like it's there. Um, I, I think the only other thing I would just say is, you know, we need leadership from all different sectors, as I said. So in terms of your last question, you know, people in this room, people listening, you know, everyone needs to be championing and calling for more action on, on NCDs because everyone has someone in their family, a friend who's affected or living with it themselves, essentially. This is a global challenge that requires a global response. Absolutely. I think we all know somebody living with at least one NCD or chronic condition. So I want to th say thank you to our esteemed panelists for joining us today here at Concordia, and thanks to Concordia, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.